and introduce our next speaker. She is remotely connecting through the phone. So we are hoping that her So this is Jackie Michelle. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we we see you, Jackie. Uh, so, like she said, uh, Dr. Jackie Michelle is the president and one of the original founders of Research Planning Inc. in Columbia, South Carolina. She also is one of the original creators of the concept of sensitivity mapping as an oil spill planning and response tool, which has become one of the key components of oil spill preparedness and risk assessment. She is an internationally recognized expert in oil and hazardous materials spill planning and response with a primary focus in the areas of oil safe and effect, non-floating oil, shoreline cleanup, alternative response technologies, and natural resource damage assessment. Uh, much of her expertise is derived from her role since 1978 as part of the scientific support team to the U.S. Coast Guard provided by NOAA, and she leads shoreline assessment teams and assists in selecting cleanup methods to minimize the environmental impact of the spill. She's also part of the NOAA Assessment and Restoration Division's Rapid Assessment Program and was the NOAA uh, GATT coordinator for Louisiana during the Deepwater deep Horizon oil spill. Uh, she has written over 200 manuals, reports, and science papers on civil planning and response. And although she could not be here with us physically, she more than graciously said she would be with us remotely. And so without further ado, Dr. Michelle, go right ahead. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for the invitation to present. And um, I've been asked to talk about the impacts of oil on marshes. And since uh, you mentioned the sensitivity index mapping, you know, the marshes are the highest ranked shoreline type in the, in the ESI scale, number 10. And a lot of times when we talk about um, spills in marshes, um, you, know, it's the, uh, you know, what do we do in terms of the environmental trade-offs between the effects of the oil and the effects of the cleanup? Because we're always trying to kind of make sure that we, um, you know, stop. the goal of shoreline cleanup is to speed the recovery of the oiled habitat. And so we're always trading off the impacts of the oil on the habitat and the biological users of those habitats, and then and things that might happen off-site if we don't do anything in terms to remove the oil, versus all those things that we know that are collateral damage that comes from when we um, attempt to clean up in such a sensitive environment such as marsh habitat, from trampling and mixing oil deeper into the soils and removing the surface soils and smothering the plants and um, causing other damages. So, you know, everything that we talk about and, and when we have a spill in a mangrove, I mean, a, in a marsh is to, and mangroves too, they're all both sen the most sensitive, is to try to, you know, trade off what we think is, we can do to speed the overall recovery. And so, w what we've done is to sort of help provide some guidance and some understanding about how oil affects marshes is to look at um, several important factors, and one of them is oil type. Um, and I'll talk about that first, but then there's also the extent of contamination on the vegetation, and the, and then the next is the degree of contamination in the soils. You know, like I'm a geochemist, and I used to call them sediments, but I work with a soil scientist, and I've been, you know, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I know that if anything's growing in in the ground, that is a soil, not a not a sediment. So we talk about soils, but another really important factor is the exposure to currents and waves, which essentially, you know, speeds the whole natural recovery processes. And then time of year can be important in terms of how oil affects a marsh habitat. And so I'm going to talk, you know, mostly about in the beginning about um, uh, the, the most toxic oil, and that is a number two fuel oil, or diesel, or home heating oils. These are all essentially light refined products. And um, we've got a couple of case histories that where um, spills of these types of oils cause significant um, impact to marshes. And two of them occurred in Buzzards Bay. Um, uh, uh, early, you know, pretty uh, years ago, and another one occurred in the 90s in, in, in um, Arthur Hill in New York. And all of these spills were, were where the oil came ashore, you know, was spilled very close to shore, and was blown into and had very heavy loading into the marsh, penetrated into the soils and sediments, and then and it was a very sheltered setting, and so that oil then was not rapidly flushed out. And all of those cases, we, there, there was high mortality um, of the marsh. Which we don't, and then that ha that mortality happened pretty quickly. You know, we don't see that. You know, just as Ed talked about, sometimes on the you think these sensitive environments, they don't always die right away, but they die by other pathways besides acute toxic exposure to the, both the plant tissues and, and the roots and to the marsh soils. And here's some pictures from the the work that was done there by a, a group at Woods Hole that show 
one of those spills on Buzzards Bay where you can see um, uh, uh, three years later after the marsh, you know, the marsh was oil, the vegetation died, the marsh soils were eroded down to nothing. So that's, that's an example of how when you have a, high, a light refined product that is persistent in the environment, not gasoline. Gasoline usually evaporates so quickly, but under certain conditions, um, these uh, uh, these oils, home heating oils, number two for oils, can cause significant mortality. And this has been demonstrated in in, um, in people who uh, I say torture plants in the laboratory. You know, Ed and Irv Mendelson and, and a bunch of folks that uh, at, in, L in Louisiana, you know, torture these plants and then look how they survive. And so here's um, you see there's a nice dose response curve between the oil dose to the sediments, and these are the milligrams per gram dry soil, and th that, that's a lot. I mean, th this is 7,000 parts per million, so these concentrations are very high, and we, we all don't often see that those high concentrations for number two fuel oil from real spills. But the top one shows the above ground biomass, and the bottom one shows the below ground biomass, and you can see the more oil you get in the soils, the more plants you kill. And that's very, you know, we see that nice relationship with number two fuel oils but not so much with the other oils. There are other important factors that affect how medium food oils and heavy um, refined products affect marsh vegetation. Okay, so, and, and those other two factors are the extent of contamination of the vegetation and the degree of contamination in the soils. And I'm gonna, you know, a picture's a thousand words, so a lot of the, the way that, you know, we try to show people what, what it looks like now here's a spill of a heavy fuel oil, number six fuel oil, in the Cape, River, Cape Fear River in North Carolina. And you can see that the, um, you know, some of the oil coating on the vegetation, this is, you know, a, a scurpa species is up in the brackish part. But this is along a river, you know, it's a tidal river. You can see there's pretty strong currents. It's got boat traffic. There's a, a, a port facility there. And so two years later, you go back and look at it, and it was um, a pretty good recovery. Um, you can sort of see, see the church in the background, you know, we try to get the same perspective. So, but in this case, the oil coated the lower part of the plants, you know, the stems, but not very much of the leaves. And so the leaves were still able to, to, you know, perform their photosynthetic processes and everything else. And also, note, see, there's no contamination or, or little contamination of the soils around there in the marsh. So if we just coat the vegetation, vegetation came back pretty well. But at the same spill, you go down a little bit further, and here's... Uh, uh, another area where there was a little bit heavier coating, some of the lower leaves are more heavily coated. And over that same time period, you look at it and you say that, oh, you know, the vegetation was a little thinner. So there was some impact, but, you know, the vegetation didn't die. There was just partial mortality. Same place. And so what we find, and even from, from studies, um, where, again, we do get that, that, that gross relationship where if you have um, uh, high oil concentrations, and again, these are in milligrams per gram, which are, or, you know, so this is 200 parts per thousand, if you th um, per million, if you think in terms of PPM, you know, where you get real high concentrations, really high concentrations, you get decreases in the, um, you know, above ground biomass. And in fact, in this case, the very heaviest oiling, you didn't have any live vegetation, it was all dead. And so in, in those cases where you get very heavy loading of the soils, um, you can't have plant mortality. But the most important factor for me a lot of times is the exposure to currents and waves. Okay. And, I'll, and, and I'll, I'll talk about two end members. You know, one is here's a spill in the Strait of Magellan way down in the, you know, the southern tip of um, Chile. Um, this spill occurred in 1974 and there was no cleanup. You know, Allende had just been shot and you know, all they did was refloat the vessel and, you know, and, and get it out of there. And so they all came ashore, and you know, of course, when you have that much oil in the water, you know, the oil seems to always come ashore during spring high tides. So in this case, they all topped over the banks of the tidal creek and flowed onto the marsh platform. Very heavy oiling in an area that's very cold, very dry, and the oil was very thick. So here it looks like in 1976, two years later, when we were went down, to, this was our first oil spill that we studied. So it was, we learned a whole lot. Um, and a ground shot, you can see here where the vegetation is, most of the vegetation is dead. And then people go back later, here's 1981, you know, there's almost been no little recovery because the oil has formed a thick coating on top of the vegetation. So, you know, there's no, um, no microbial breakdown of this material because it's so thick and the surface gets hard. And so you have real long, long-term impacts, cold, dry, thick oil, no removal. And then here's an, another infrared picture of the same area you can see. 
lots of dead black areas and the, the red plants are the are live. So there's you know, over time there's a little bit of recovery in some places where it's not so bad. So that's one end member that shows um long term impact from an area where you had, you know, all the wrong things that, that, that lead to long term persistence. Then there was a spill in, in the Savannah River uh, between South Carolina and Georgia from a vessel called the Amazon Venture. And um, you know, in the Savannah River, the, the, you know, this is right at the apex of the Georgia Bight, so the tidal range goes up to, and the highest peak tides of the year are over 10 feet. And so the currents are really strong. And so here's uh, some poor people trying to pull a boom across the river. And you notice, can you tell which direction the water's flowing? You can, you know, by this you can see it's flowing from the top to the bottom because there's getting entrainment under the um, the boom. But the oil is, you know, still floating. It pops to the surface down current and then continues to move. So the currents are very strong and a big tidal range, so you get lots of flushing. And so, and, and then here shows the picture of the some of the um, upper part. You know, this area is right next to the Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, which has, you know, a really important uh, wintering area for 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 du the dabbling ducks. And the spill occurred in December, but we were able to hose all of the water intakes into the uh, ponds, so there were very very limited um, bird mortality. But you can see how it is difficult it is to maintain you know, proper boom deployment, you know, in an area with such big currents and, and tidal range. And because of those conditions, you know, over 650 acres of shoreline, of marsh shoreline, were moderately or heavily oiled. And even more than that was lightly oiled. So where did the oil go? You know, wherever it wanted to under those conditions. Even in a river where you think you have some, um, some chance to do some containment and recovery, it was very difficult under those strong conditions. So what is what were the impacts? And so remember, uh, if you look at this picture, you know um, there's two things in this that tells you a, a little hint about where this is. First of all, this little sign. What do you think that says? This is boundary of National Wildlife Refuge. Okay. So here's the one of the uh, the little uh, tide control gates, and that goes to the ponds. And so you can see here that the oil coated the vegetation very heavily. This was a heavy fuel oil. But but it does not stick to the wet mud surface. It was only on the vegetation, you know, because you know, especially salt mark, marsh plants, you know, they have a waxy coating which is part of their ability to withstand salt exposure. And so you know, there's a you know, like attracts like. So waxy oils love to stick to waxy plant surfaces. So you get this very heavy coating. And I remember that um, uh, uh, we went down there to all the resource folks, and they said, well, what do we want to do? And then God, you know, they said we got to do something. We got to cut the vegetation. We got to do something because this is really bad. And we convinced them that we thought that the oil would, you know, would slough off in the next growing season. You know, the, the river has got some suspended sediment in it that would, you know, the oil would become non-sticky after a few weeks. And so, every, you know, the, the decision was to not to do any further cutting or flushing or anything else that would damage these sensitive banks. And you go back later, and this is what it looks like. You know, we had full recovery. You know, the oil didn't, you know, go away. It, it, it was coated on the stems. The stems got broken off and released during the next growing season and that went into the estuary but um, but it was uh, more weathered and we did not cause additional habitat damage. And so here's a little bit area further up um, in, up in the river. You know we did do um, uh, removal of oiled rack. So here we are in the sawgrass area and this is the game, the game warden at the refuge and uh, I went out with him two years later. Same guy but he shaved his beard. <laughs> and um, he, he, he said, "I got a girlfriend now." So uh, you, uh, <laughs> I said, "I said, darn! I wanted to be the same. You know, I like them to be just the same." But anyway, so you know, um, later on, you know, the, the, this area was so flush. You know, we saw no evidence of oil anywhere um, after the spill. And then there are important seasonal effects. What we find is that when you have oiling in the winter during the, you know, whatever, or whatever the dormant season is, depending on what hemisphere you're in, right? Um, you have the lowest impact because, you know, essentially for marshes in many places, you know, the above ground vegetation goes into senescence in the wintertime and, and, um, and the plants kind of, you know, slow down and so um, you don't have the impacts that you, that you would expect from when you have heavily oiled vegetation. But the oil impacts are greatest in the growing season when they're, you know, the plants are, you know, putting out a lot of above ground vegetation, using up their carbohydrate resources and, and then, then they're more stressful. And we find that oil plants, you know, early in don't flower too well and they don't produce seed because their oiling is a stress. And, and sometimes you can have plant mortality a year later depending on the conditions. And a good example of this, of, the, of how in the wintertime, you know, here's a, a, a spill of a mixture of a 
heavy fuel oil and a uh, called an IFO uh, 180, um, which is you know a heavy. It's like a bunker fuel, and that was the fuel oil. But it also spilled the cargo, which was a number two fuel oil. And of course, this this occurred in, in late September. And of course, during a spring tide. So so where did they all go? You know, almost the entire intertidal marsh was covered. And this is mostly Spartina up in this little creek. You know, look at the extent of contamination. So you know, what do we do there? Um, but uh, you know, so what you do when you can't do anything else, you put out sorbents, and you try to uh, you know recover any oil that's being released. But I went back one year later. So what do you think happened to this marsh? Did it die, or did it live? Live. Live. Yeah. So here it is, one year later. Wow, isn't that amazing? Because the plants were already in senescence. So, you know, if you go back and look at this, you know, um, it's hard to tell, but there was very little, you know, almost no contamination of the soils. I mean, the oil, you know, the, it's all water saturated. It didn't penetrate the burrows even. Um, and so the vegetation recovered very well. That's pretty amazing. Except, and, and then here's another area. Here's some Spartina patens, which is like they call it salt meadow hay or wire grass. And, um, and so here you can see the, here's the, edge of the marsh is, you know, all these little points are still the same. You know, there was no mortality, even though there was pretty heavy oiling. Except there were, because I, we worked on the natural resource damage assessment, and there were 96 little spots that looked like this, where the vegetation did die. Look at that. See the plant stems are all broken off? And what we think is that that was where some of the number two oil that was the cargo that spilled, you know, you know stranded. And so that was a uh, toxicity effect from the lighter refined oil, but the heavier oil that just coated the vegetation did not cause those effects. Because in those little patches is where we can see some of the um, oil in the soils. And so, um, you know, NOAA has developed a whole bunch of guides that we have that, you know, to help us um, uh, make, you know, at least have a better basis to start when we make decisions. And when you look at um, our, these, these cleanup matrices for, for different habitats, particularly, and this is the one for salt marshes, you know, oil groups go from gasoline is one. These are light refined products like diesels. These are medium oils, and you know, mostly medium crude oils. And these are heavy crude oils and heavy refined products. And when you and I call them grades, but you know, A is a good thing. A has the least adver adverse habitat, whereas D has the most adverse habitat, habitat impact. And that's a combination of both of the oil and the response technique. And the, and the effect of the response technique, you know, you can do something that doesn't damage the habitat, but it may not remove the oil, so it still gets a bad grade. So this is a combination of both factors. And so, for example, you see here, we'll say um, uh, uh, sorbents, you know, are always good for lighter oils, but they're not really effective, you know, for the most heavy oils. You know, they won't, you know, that oil doesn't wash off as much. So we get this degradation in effectiveness from the same technique because it's not as effective. So I'm going to go through some of these things, you know. And so what we normally do, you know, if you look here on what techniques we have, you know, there are marshes, you know, natural recovery, you know, a lot of these things aren't very good. There are a few things that we think might work. And I'm going to go through those that we have used in the past and kind of show you how they work or not, depending on the site conditions. And so what we normally look at is we have natural recovery, we use sorbents, we use flushing. Um, sometimes we've used surface washing agents. Manual removal, cutting, and then in situ burning, which is a whole separate talk, which I don't have time to go over today. But um, in fact, um, they're they're deciding today to burn a oil spill in a photon marsh in Louisiana, and in the, right at the head of the Chapalai Basin, because they think that's the best response option. And we actually burn marshes um, under the right conditions as a as a very effective oil removal tool that minimizes damage to the actual marsh. Okay, so natural recovery. You know, if you have a small amount of oil, you got some nice good exposure to waves and currents or ice, depending on your location, and it's an ongoing season, we often recommend um, natural recovery. And, you know, and the concern is as well, you know, can we, are there certain animals that are really important or, you know, large numbers of animals that might be at risk if we, you know, if we let them be exposed to the oil during that natural recovery process? And so, um, you know, a good example of that was the um, that spill in the um, in Maine. You know, I, I, I remember uh, we had long, heated discussions with the bird biologists who were scared to death that, that the birds were going to come in and get oiled. But you know, what we find out is that usually within three to four weeks, the oil is no longer tacky, and it, it poses much a less contact hazard, you know, for animals in the marsh. 
you know, the secret of marsh birds are going to always get oiled because that's, you know, that's their habitat. But the other animals that, that sort of use the adjacent habitats are much less at risk. And normally, you know, natural recovery, we, what we do is we put out sorbents to try to um, recover any oil that's mobilized, you know, through any process. But you got to make sure you put those things out properly and maintain them. And then I don't like to put sorbents out to make, sure, make people think we're doing something because that, you just make a lot of waste. And all that, most of that sorbent material is not you know, recycled or reused. It goes into a landfill. And so here's an example of a, of a spill in, in the Neches River in Texas where you know, that's not proper sorbent you know, deployment technique. It's supposed to be on the water. But, that, but, but a vessel had just come by, and, and some of these larger ships you know, displaced a lot of water. So it thrown all of our you know, sorbent material onto the marsh surface. And so that causes a lot of problems. And so this is crushing the vegetation, and you know it's not not being effective at all. So you have to work real hard. So here's a spill in another one in Texas, um, what we call the Texas City-wide spill that occurred last year, where you know the, here's the oil marsh, and they are putting sorbents out, staking it so it doesn't get um, uh, pushed onto the marsh, and it is effective at recovering any oil that's washed off during tidal flushing and and, and the passage of vessels. Because this is right in the Houston Ship Channel, so you can see here's a, a vessel going back. You know, this is right behind you know what they call Bolivar Roads, where um, there's lots of vessel traffic. And then of course, sorbents, you know, they get away sometimes. So here's a this is the, the what we call the Tampa Bay spill that Ed talked about. Um, one year later, I was poking around the mangroves prior to our uh, work, workshop and um, found a lot of uh, sorbent material. You know, that proposes you know all kinds of um, uh, hazards to wildlife, you know, using those habitats. But sorbents can also be um, hand deployed. So here's an example of a, of a spill. You know, they're not always just strung on, you know, on uh, ropes and, um, you know, deployed on the water surface. So here they're using sorbents inside a marsh where, you know, there, no other technique was effective. So they're, you know, walking on what, what you, you must, must appreciate are really slippery walking boards. But they're using sorbents there to pick up the oil that was pretty thick right there inside the marsh. Cause they, and they're doing that because this, it was not, not accessible for, you know, you couldn't haul um, long uh, pumps and uh, hoses to like to do vacuuming in here. Um, and then also, um, very seldom, but under the, all the right conditions, we will um, use what we call loose natural sorbents to reduce wildlife contact hazards. So here's a spill in Louisiana where they're using bag gas and spraying it on the marsh edge to sort of you know, reduce, you know, speed the, the rate at which that oil will become no longer tacky. And, um, and, and so lo most of the time, you know, we, we'd like to ask you know, RRT approval you know, um, to, to, to apply these loose sorbents because we're not recovering them. And um, so we, you know, those have to be carefully monitored because sometimes people get carried away. Another use of, of loose natural organic sorbents is uh, shown here where you know, this was where we were doing some of the vegetation cutting to, to get access to a thick oil layer on the surface. Then, then we were spraying, you know, um, uh, putting sorbents down and, so that, and mixing it in with this potato rake here to try to help you know, us remove the, you know, the oil material. And then we put a, a little thin layer, because you know, this was a really fresh, um, you know, sticky uh, substrate after we had scraped the oil off. So we put a little sorbents on there just as a contact hazard you know, for the next day. So you know, in some lot of areas you have t you know, high tides, you know, that, that, that gets washed off pretty quickly. But it's an attempt to be very careful. Uh, another technique that, that, that people want to use in time is, is, is flushing. And you have to be very careful about the pressures because um, here's a spill in, um, in, in France called the Amacocadiz where you can see the oil is really thick in this marsh. And so the army came in and just flushed it. Now that's pretty intensive flushing. And so after they flushed it, you know, there's no marsh soils. They're down to the, you know, the, to the bee horizon. You can see there's nothing but rocks and clay there. And that area where they flushed took seven years to recover compared to areas where they didn't flush took three and a half years. So you have to be careful about flushing that you don't um, uh, disturb the soils. And that's hard to do during a spill emergency. But sometimes flushing can be effective. A uh, uh, spill in the, um, in the Patuxent River in Virginia I mean, in Maryland in 2000, this was a pipeline break. You see the pipeline uh, occurred right in here, and so the oil flowed into the interior part of this marsh, and then you know, came out and got other areas. But what are you, do what are you doing here? I mean, how do you get oil out of this from an interior spill? And that happens a lot in, in Louisiana because so many of the pipelines you know, cross uh, wetland areas. 
and um, and you you think you know, geez, God, that would have been a perfect place to burn it, wouldn't it? You know, there's no houses around here. Um, it's remote, and you know, and there, you, it looks like you could have good control of the burn. But you can hardly tell. But but what's you see these like long lines across here? What do you think those are? Well, the pipeline was was is, was a was going to a power plant that provided power for all of Eastern Maryland. And those are the transmission line leading from the pipeline out, you know, from the power plant out to the distribution center. So we decided that we couldn't burn that one, um, you know, because when you burn, I mean, that that would have definitely damaged the uh, the power lines. So even though we were tempted, you know, but we didn't. So essentially, there, what you're forced to do, because you know, the water water is very flat. You know, um, when the tide goes up and down, you get a little bit of slope, but but you know, you have to use flushing in order to press. To push oil, you know, from one, you know, it's a liquid on a liquid, so you need to have some kind of um, mechanism to push the oil through containment and recovery devices. And so, in this case, this was an EPA managed spill, and they dug these these trenches. So I'm going to go back one here, and you can see, look at this trench network, which they felt that they had to do to you know, to dig, and then using, um, you know, uh, trash pumps and leaf blowers to push oil to containment and recovery devices. Very difficult. Flushing looks good on paper, but it's tough. And I like to show this because it shows, um, you know, here we were, you know, doing testing of a low pressure flushing system that was developed, but but it was too late. The oil really wasn't flushable. But you know, this is something that they put on a on a barge, and this is just a concrete pumping system with a spreader bar um, there. And you know, I'm I'm waiting for the next time we might be able to use something like this because I was pretty impressed with, you know, how you could, you know, flush uh, marsh because usually when you have edge oiling, you know, how do you get behind the marsh with all your stuff and flush it toward Containment and recovery devices at the shoreline edge. You got, so this is one way to get behind it without a bunch of footsteps. Uh, and um, here's an example of a surface washing agents. Um, and these are chemical agents. They're surfactants, very different than dispersants. They're, you know, they're designed to, um, uh, you know, to uh, you know, emulsify the oil. And there's two types of, of these surface washing agents. You have to be really careful. One of them is are, in fact, most of them are what I call lift and disperse. You know, they're like soap, and they lift the oil and they emulsify it in the water column. And there's no recovery. But there's about five or six on the national product schedule that are that are what I call lift and float, and they do um, uh, uh, increase the amount of oil that gets off the shoreline and then really makes it available so you can pick it up. Because I mean, we don't want to wash it off and disperse it. And so here's an example where we were applying it. You know, we did a test. Um, on the marshes, because remember how heavily oiled they were, and they we're worried about the birds. And we said, well, maybe we could use these surface washing agents to, to increase the amount of oil. So here we are flushing it off the vegetation. There's Charlie Henry walking around taking water samples to see how much got in the water column. And then you look at the, you know, and here's the area after. You know, it looked pretty good. I mean, you know, here in the upper left, you can see where the, you know, the black on the vegetation. And here, this looks pretty good. But what we found out was that essentially. So here's what it was before. Here's the oil on the vegetation, and then, and then here's a close-up of after we used the surface washing agents. And the the top half of the, you know the, the part that was, you know the vegetation was kind of laid over. So you got about half the oil off one side, but this is you know spartanol from the flora, and on the underside it was still the oil was still there. The you know the surface didn't, didn't seep around and, and clean the underside. It was only a contact, and so the you know we decided that it really it wasn't worthwhile, so we didn't do it. But um, it might be a tool in the toolbox under special conditions. And so there's always a lot of push and to talk about, you know, manual removal and cutting in marshes. And when we, we consider that when the oil is really thick, and of course the deep water horizon is a, um, a classic example where in those areas where the oil, you know, stranded very thickly on the marsh and on the vegetation, then we had a storm come through and it knocked all that down. And so it made a uh, broke off some of the oil vegetation on the edge and piled it in this really nasty pile of heavily oiled rack. And so we did um, develop some techniques. You know, we did some pilot tests. It was very rigorous, you know, very careful study design to, to make sure that we were doing the things that, that did speed recovery. And so here we're picking up the uh, heavily oiled rack with pitchforks. Everybody's working on walking boards. And then we cut the oil vegetation to get access to the um, uh, underlying oil. So we didn't cut the vegetation to remove the oil vegetation. We did that to remove the thick oil underneath in this one case. And in fact, um, you know, the techniques that we developed through a, a pretty rigorous program you know, were pretty effective. Here's uh, one year later. This is uh, the upper left. Is there's no oil in this environment. Here's an area where we didn't do anything. We just let the marsh go for natural recovery. 
and the lower left is where we did the rake and cut. And that looked pretty good. You know? And so we're very promising. Here's the same area in 2002, 12, I mean, um, uh, manual treatment, no treatment. You can see how that heavy, thick layer, you know, has slowed recovery. And um, the Tulane folks did, got some funding to do some exper experimental planting in these areas that were um, uh, uh, cut. And look at this picture. I mean, we are, you know, look at the recovery of the habitat here where they planted it. And these were just bare stem seedlings, you can see, uh, uh, sprigs. And yet that, that slowed erosion and sped vegetative recovery. And so we have made a big deal in our um, new marsh job aid to uh, promote um, uh, planting as planting as part of the response um, in areas where that are, are prone to erosion, especially where the vegetation has been heavily oiled. Uh, so, but cutting the marsh usually you were you know that's usually um, problematic. Um, here's that same that spill in the Cape Fear River where before we got on scene, um, you know the responsible party had gone out and done some cutting here, and you can see um, one year or two years later you can see what, how effective that was. Okay, let's go back. So you know here's Here's the same pile of material and everything else. You know, there's no vegetation left. You know, the, all you, you can see the stumps, right, of the of the uh, and the roots there where there's been some erosion. So that in that case, cutting caused more damage. And, you know, actually, you know, the marsh is now gone. Whereas in the other areas that were heavily oiled, you know, pretty similar, so heavily oiled they're laying over here. The vegetation, you know, recovered pretty pretty well. But that's not always the case, you know. So here's here's another area of another um, a mini and uh, heavy crude oil in the Delaware River, and uh, you know years later it looks great. Um, another same spill, a different part, different state where they said, well, this is an important bird nesting area. We want to have the vegetation cut, and of course you know these guys are you know you know they're they don't even have PPE on properly, and I can't tell if this guy's smoking a cigarette or not, but um, <laughs> you know. You know, these, these guys are, you know, it looks pretty rough, doesn't it? And, and also it's pretty high energy, you know, and look at this vessel traffic and everything. And we'll look what happened to that marsh. Yeah, so, you know, so, so, so much for the important bird nesting habitat, huh? But, uh, but look at the substrate. I mean, it's pretty rocky. That's pretty poor substrate. And I'll show one more example. This is the same spill. You know, remember, we're looking at three different locations. One of them that where there was no cutting and it looked like it was recovery. One that was cut that didn't do well. And here's another one that was cut. And these guys, you know, they got PPE on. You know, this looks a little bit more, you know, professional. Not so many people out there. Also, there's riprap along the edge that's protecting it. And then the, over the same time period, that came back fine. So, you know, um, you know, one of my favorite sayings, I've never been the same spill twice. And, and, and every, even every site can be different in terms of how it responds, responds based on that site-specific conditions. So we normally recommend cutting only when it's absolutely necessary to prevent some, you know, some special species of concern, oiling, or if you have to cut the vegetation to get to large amounts of bulk oil. And we want, you know, the resource folks to consider that the oil will weather and become non-sticky in a, you know, in, in a, usually weeks. And so, but if you do cut, you know, you can cause habitat um, recovery delays. And and if you're going to cut, you know, um, you know, we got to use walking boards and do it from boats and do everything you can to minimize foot, foot traffic. And so, uh, one thing that we've done, I, uh, I know Ed talked about, um, you know, the variable rates of different habitats of mangroves, and you know, and there's all, all kinds of reasons for that. And so, what we're able to do was, um, in this recent um, literature synthesis we did for NOAA, we looked at 35, 33 um, spill conditions, um, based and, and plotted the recovery in years for them, and the the, the light pan that you can barely see are the refined oils, and um, and the blue are the crude oils, and the red are the heavy refined oils, and the ones highlighted in yellow where they were, there was intense treatment going on. And you can see that the rec recovery rate can be as, as quickly as one year, and this is mostly vegetative recovery. Very few people study any faunal component, so this is mostly, and it's mostly above ground vegetation, so, you know, these are, these recovery rates are probably the most optimistic. And so here you can see that you know it can be as quick as one year for a lot of spills, or even you know within one growing season, depending on the time of the, re of the spill. And then you know certain types of oils and there are certain degrees of treatment, um, you know slow the recovery until they can be very long. And of course the longest recovery are places like the Gulf War oil spill in the Arabian Gulf, because you know that was you know the largest, you know, twice as big as the Deepwater Horizon 
and then the the Buzzards Bay spill, where um, you know some of the impacts we still see are they're really small in area, but there's still an impact, you know, from the deep penetration of that number two floor in the burrows. There's been some really very well published studies on that. And then the Matula spill in the Strait of Magellan, because it was so cold and thick and dry. And then um, some areas where burning occurred, or where, you know, intrusive techniques, you know, slowed the overall recovery in certain areas. So um, if we kind of pull that, you know, pull out what we can extract from that is that we have the longest recovery for spills that occur in cold climates, sheltered settings, especially where there's thick oil on the marsh surface. But also with light refined products, if you have really heavy loading, you can have long-term impacts. Um, heavy fuel oils that form, you know, persistent thick residues, you know, both either, you know, penetrate into the marsh surface as well or where, there, where there's intensive treatment. The fastest recovery occurs when you have a nice warm climate, like in Louisiana and Texas. Um, you know, light to heavy oiling on the vegetation only. Medium crude oils seem to have, especially if they don't spill right inside the marsh. If you have a spill right inside the marsh, then the impacts are usually greater. But you know, you you know, while they're spilled on land, I mean, on water, some of the lighter fractions are lost by evaporation, and they don't have all that really as much of that heavy component as the heavier um, refined products are. So they, they're a little bit more degradable. If you have less de intense treatment, and under those conditions, you know, recovery is usually less than one growing season. It's pretty amazing. And so all of that information that we have gathered from you know both years of experience. You know, I've been I went to my first oil spill in '76 which is, oh, almost 40 years, um, and, but also uh, the, you know, the NOAA uh, hazmat, or now they call it ERD, you know, this has been up and running and doing scientific support for spills since 1978. So we've taken all that information and put it together in this more recent guide in that series of NOAA guides on oil spills, you know, planning and response considerations, and, and this is one that we just completed in cooperation with API for marshes. So I, this is available online. Um, uh, and uh, as a, a really good, dense, very dense source of information, and it has much of the information that I've spoken about today. So uh, with that, I'll take some questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, I was curious on the cutting on exposed shorelines where erosion may be uh, a problem. Have there been any uh, uh, trials with Combining cutting with, say, a temporary erosion control measure like uh, geo tube for a couple of years, so sediment or something like that, or would that uh, would that cut down flushing too much for recovery? You know, no, no one's ever tried that. Um, you know, uh, CPRA um, in Louisiana is, is doing some uh, did some planting planting in those areas that were pretty heavily damaged, and you know, and some the areas that that where we've had the biggest erosion problems usually have the biggest waves. And so it's really hard to put something that's effective um, in that environment. And so, uh, but that's great. I think under the right conditions, that would be the ideal thing to do. I mean, you know, not too exposed. You know, you don't need it when it's sheltered, but you need it when it's moderately exposed. It would be the most success. Any other questions for Jackie? I will No more questions, Jackie. Again, thank you so much for um, joining us. My pleasure. So, I guess the question goes. Uh, well, that's all. Um, I just have a few announcements before you all head out. Please, 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 we have these evaluations in your folders. You guys could please fill them out for us. These are extremely important. Uh, good and bad comments. We 